Welcome to One Insight. My name is Rich Litvin. I grew up in London and I now live in LA. And this is a podcast for extraordinary top performers. You see, I've coached some of the most successful and talented people on the planet. I see what most people cannot see, and I dare to say what most people wouldn't dare to say. And what I know about success is that on the other side of it, it can actually be lonely. You can feel like more of an imposter the more successful you become. And when you're the most interesting person in the room, you're actually in the wrong room. I coach around insight. Life looks one way, something happens, the world looks different, and your entire world changes. It can happen in an instant. And this podcast is called One Insight because a single insight can change everything. Kimberly has been a professional coach for two years, but she's been coaching for years before that. You see, she was a senior executive at a Fortune 7 corporation. She's been in that world for 21 years. She's worked with, um, to build a reputation where she's running large operational teams, 12,000 people at its height, $14 billion business portfolio. Fascinating woman, except deep down, this woman is a rebel. And we draw this out of her. This is a woman who comes alive when she can look someone in the eyes and say, do this. No attachment to whether they do it or not, but sometimes people need to hear that, especially high level leaders. And it was really fun drawing this out of her and I watched her come alive. Uh, enjoy this conversation and I, as usual, listen, as I'm, I'm drawing this out from her and I'm coaching her, imagine I'm doing this for you. And then look for that place of what most people don't know about you. That's a really interesting question to focus on. Enjoy this conversation. Hi, Kimberly. Hi, Rich. I've been looking forward to this conversation and you know how I like to play. I want to see a little bit about where, where does your story come from? What do you do? How do you see the threads that can be hard to see when we're in our own world? We just can't see quite who we are and our gifts or our, our challenges in the way that others can. I'm sure you're great at doing this for other people, right? <laughs> well, I try to be, but it, you're right. It's, it's kind of like a fish that lives in water. So yeah. I'm, I'm game for this. Perfect. All right, well, let's play. Let me ask you, tell me a little bit about your career right now. Bring me up to date. You've been coaching professionally for how long? About two years. Um, you know, it's been, this is the year that I declared it's no longer a hobby and it truly is a career. Um, but I've been away from my corporate job for about three years and bringing on clients for the last two years. Tell me about corporate world. What, what were you doing? Yeah, so I was a senior executive at a Fortune 7 telecommunications firm. I worked there for 21 years. I ran, I did all sorts of things, but um, mostly I built my reputation around running very large operational teams um, specifically kind of global call center environments. Um, at, at one point, my largest team was 12,000 employees, not including the management team, so a little over 12,000 people. Um, and then when I left the company, my last role there, I had moved to the business side of the house, and I had a business portfolio valued at a little north of $14 billion. Tell me, I'm curious. Yeah. You say you you built your reputation with large operational teams, twelve thousand at its height. What was it actually that you did? What was yeah. actually your gift in there? Yeah, that smile tells me you have a sense of it. Yeah. Um, you know, I think <laughs> my gift is problem was probably why I'm here with you today because the thing that I love the most um, was coaching people, inspiring people to, to show up and to do things that they didn't even think they were capable of doing. Mm -hmm. uh, one of 
of the things that I really, I don't want to say prided myself on, but loved about leading those teams was I could go to the Philippines every six months and see my team that, you know, that I hadn't seen in months and know something about just about every person on my sales floor and have a personal, meaningful conversation with them. If it was about a recipe or something their kids were doing, you know, and the language barrier didn't matter. I just, it's, that's the part that I loved doing. Um, and I don't know, we just ran our operation in a way that was so different than other people. There was a lot of storytelling. Um, I remember one year I had just taken a new role in a really tough assignment and my team and I wrote this entire fairy tale <laughs> about our organization that people just loved in, instead of, you know, pitching our eight point plan of what we're going to do, eight strategies and tactical plans. We put it all in a story in a fairy tale and we slayed it that year. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Tell, tell me, take me back to your childhood. Was it, your mom or your dad or someone else who encouraged you to do things you didn't know you were capable of doing? Yeah. Um, I would credit both my parents, but especially my mother. Hmm. She let me try absolutely anything that I wanted to try. Do you remember a story? In, yeah. Yeah. Tell me a story from when you wanted to try something and your mom let you try it. <laughs> one of our favorite stories is I took horseback riding lessons one year. <laughs> and um, I don't know, I was probably nine at the time. And my mom was sitting in the arena. This is when you could smoke everywhere. My mom was a heavy smoker. And she was sitting in the arena watching me smoking her cigarette. And I'm just whipping it around the arena. This horse is we were going so fast and my mom was thinking, ha, look at Kimmy, which is who I was at the time. Look at Kimmy. She's really riding that horse. She had no idea that that horse was spooked by her cigarette and had gone <laughs> mad. <laughs> and the trainer's trying to tell my mom to put the cigarette out and I'm screaming. I wasn't screaming though. And that's why she didn't know I was worried. Cause I don't scream under pressure. Um, but that is, that's a, that's a story of legend in our household. I love that story. I love your mother already. Oh my God, Margaret is the best. Hmm. What, what, what was another one of your gifts in the world? So, you know, you, you knew things about people. You're a storyteller. You inspired people to do things that they didn't know they could do. What was one more of your gifts? Yeah, I think it's a, a version of I knew things about people. I know things about people. I innately, you know, some people, it's, there are all sorts of psychic gifts that we are imbued with, and some of us use them and some of us don't. But I've always had the ability to know things about people, And I mean, just deeply, there's a knowingness of something about someone that they haven't, maybe haven't shared with, with anyone else ever, or maybe don't even know about themselves until we start talking about it. Yeah. Um, you call it psychic gifts, but throughout most of human history, that ability to understand people uh, meant that you could survive. It was often a survival mechanism. You would understand something about the interaction in that group, that community that kept you safe. You understood that, that why it's gone quiet right now means the enemy is about to attack. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's not a psychic gift when things, when life is in danger, it's what helps right. you survive. That's right. You have some of those abilities and you've honed them. What's, let me turn it on you for a second. What's one thing about you 
that most people never know. <laughs> um, something about me that most people never know or would never think is I mean I can be pretty scared about things more often than I think people think I'm, I am you know I have a, a system a mechanism that sorts through that pretty quickly but it shows up Hmm. And that's interesting to me because you said a bit earlier, I don't scream under pressure. Mm -mm. No, <laughs> no, I don't. Where, where'd you learn that from? What was the, who was the model for you for that? That was probably my dad. He's, um, he's a stoic person. Now, what I've heard is some of your gifts. I'm always fascinated by the dark side of a gift. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So your ability to coach and inspire people and encourage them to do things they don't even know they're capable of doing. What's the dark side of that? Yeah, one potential dark side of that is... There, there can sometimes be too much risk taken. Um, I haven't always been the best vetter, if you know what I mean. Um, You're a risk taker? Yeah. You know, <laughs> I don't think of myself as such, but when I say the things that I do out loud, people are like, no way would I ever do that. But to me, it feels very normal. And like, I feel like I need more adventure and risk in my life. Um, but yes, there's, you know, there can be a tendency to just jump right in and then figure it out on the back end. Mm -hmm. I mean, can be exhilarating or nearly fatal. And it's been both mm -hmm. in my life. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me, is this one true as well? This ability to coach and inspire people and have them do things they didn't even know they were capable of. A dark side that I see where I do that is I can sometimes put pressure on people where I don't mean to, but it's just how I think and they feel pressure from that. Is that a side for you? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's brilliant. I think how my flavor of that is sometimes if you, if you wed that gift also with the gift of I know things that other people just really don't yet know, I can sometimes show up as just do this. <laughs> Turns out people don't really love that. Um, and it doesn't so show up so much with my clients because I can practice some restraint, but with my family and the people closest to me, that rears its head a lot. Yeah. My hand's up. <laughs> I know that one too. <laughs> and so interestingly weird, enough, like that. That, this is weird, right? Um, interesting enough, Derek Sivers, who's an amazing writer, um, business uh, owned entrepreneur, sold his first business for 20 million and, writes a lot he's writing a new series of books that are about to come out maybe one just one book the working title i don't know if it'll actually be called this is do this and and whilst mm -hmm. a great coach is taught in coaching school never to say do this there's a place where right. when you're the kind of person who spent 21 years leading big corporations at a high level ran a business portfolio of 14 million dollars led teams of 12,000 people, there are moments when it is okay to say, do this. If you're too attached to them doing it, then, then you've lost the sense of being a coach. But do this and then seeing how they respond in the face of that, there's, some real, there's something really magical about that. I think most coaches are afraid of that. Actually. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think in the beginning, I love, I love how you've positioned that because I did go through a coaching certification program that I really still enjoy. Um, that feeds something inside of me that feels important. Um, but I absolutely did learn that. And I have a rebel spirit. <laughs> and so I, I chafed at that bit a lot until I finally just decided you know, there are so many different aspects of who I am and what's in my medicine bag that I really can't be worried about not sometimes telling people what I think is best for them to do. They don't have to do it. And I tell everyone that. You don't have to do it, but mm. if it were me, this is what I would do. Tell me, what, what's held you back for most of your life? Mm, God. Um, yeah, so we talked about Margaret, who I love and adore. Um, disappointing her or not getting her approval has been my Achilles heel. Yeah. I can remember right before I was going to college, my parents paid for me to go to school and um, so I didn't have to spend any time getting school scholarships they had just really planned in a certain way and it was really important to them so um when i was making my decision about what i was going to study i said to my mom i'm gonna be a writer you know this is in me it's in my soul it's what i'm meant to do and i remember her saying that's a hobby and we're paying for you to go to college so you will get a degree where you can you know make a living and so I went, I got a journalism degree and have never used it. And then I went into, you know, my corporate job. Do you write today? Um, I write a million notes a day. Hmm. I don't write the way I deeply desire to be writing. Hmm. Here's my desire for you. This is coming out of this exercise and it's coming out of coaching, but it comes from this place of do this, uh, <laughs> that you, you start a, a newsletter and it's called hmm. do this. And, and that newsletter you ask a handful of colleagues and peers and friends, hey, I'm writing a newsletter called Do This. I'm going to share with you tools, strategies, ideas, dreams, but I'm going to tell people what to do on a regular basis. This isn't airy-fairy yeah. coaching. This isn't woo-woos. This, this is like do this. It might be about, uh, uh, what's that line you like to use? You work with people from the boardroom to the bedroom. Right. So there's... One week I might be telling you what to do in, in, in corporate operations. The next week I'm telling you what to do, how to seduce your man. The next week I'm telling you how to be better at leading people. The next week I'm telling you how to be better at, uh, 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 you name it. Yeah. I see that gets you feeling alive. Yeah. Yeah. The primal goddess in me is all juiced up about that. And we yeah. love telling people what to do. <laughs> Yeah, and so that's the bit that we're so often afraid of. Let's have you own it because this is who you are. It comes out when you feel safe. Where do you feel safe? You feel safe around family. So you say, do this to whoever's around them that's close to you that you love them. Turns out it doesn't work so well. That's another story. But it's your gift. And, and so bring it out into the world. You see, Al, this is what so many coaches are afraid of. They're afraid to polarize people. And it's your job. That doesn't mean your job's to try and piss them off. Your job is to be clear about this is who I am. This is what I do. Because I promise you this, Kimberly, some people will love you whatever you do. And some people, they won't, they won't be able to stand you whatever you do. You'll remind them of their mother or their sister or the way you speak or the way you do your hair. And whatever you do or say, they wouldn't be able to stand you. And most of the 7 billion yeah. people on the planet will never know you exist. So let's not waste this lifetime you have so much value in you. 
let's get it out. Let's have you start sharing that. That's my desire for you. And I'm channeling a bit of the do this right now uh, to see where I it love goes. It. Yeah. Because it yeah. feels good, right? It's like, I, I, I'm not attached. If you said that's not my thing, it doesn't matter. But I love to bring that sense of challenge with that idea that you bring of do this and then let's see where we go. Yeah. You, you know what? In 2005, I was a high school teacher. I wasn't a professional co coach. I'd never written uh, a blog. I'd never made a video. I'd never been on YouTube. And over time, I started to write. And I would share that stuff with people. It began with the, the 20 people in my coaching school. And then it grew from there. And so it doesn't matter who it is. Get together a group of people who, hey, I'm going to share with you something called do this. It will be, it's designed to be provocative. If that's not your thing, don't read it. Would you yeah. like me to send you that email once a week and put it up on your blog? I super love this idea. Right. Right. And you are very, eff you're, I think being on camera will be effortless for you. It'll be a little bit weird to start with, but my sense is that in this day and age, for some of us, get out there and be on camera too. And again, don't worry. This isn't about trying to get 20,000 people following you on YouTube. I don't care about that. It's not the game really you're don't. playing. The yeah. game you're playing is saying something that will resonate for your people. So it mm -hmm. might start with three people. I'm, I'm in an organization with some very high level leaders and we had an expert on YouTube come and speak to us a few months ago. And he shared with us how to increase your followers on YouTube. And you can do these clever things like there's a piece of software that will identify your competitors and it will strip out the keywords that they use that you can then copy and then capture their audience who are likely to be your audience too. What was interesting, I watched people making these copious notes. What I think most people missed is what this guy said. For the first two or three years, while I was building my audience, I had one or 200 people, and that was it. Now he's got hundreds of thousands. I had one or 200 people, that was it. But I went in and I engaged with every single one of them. Yeah. And he built community. Reed Hoffman says, if you want to do something that scales, start by doing something that doesn't scale. That's how the founders of our Airbnb started. Airbnb started by renting out you know, you know, a couch in people's rooms. The founders would knock on the door and say, hey, saw you signed up on our website. Someone's staying on your couch. Can we chat with you? Wow. Yeah, what I love about that is it does take me right back to my call center days when I was just going cubicle to cubicle, just yep. saying hi to people. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's you good. knew things about those people. You could be away for six months, come back, and you knew who mm -hmm. they were and their stories. Yeah. Okay, this is great. Who are your clients? Who do they tend to be right now? Um, so most of my clients are female, um, you know, smart, powerful, confident women who don't know they're confident. It's this weird paradox that women have fallen into me too sometimes, um, where we start to believe the collective conversation around women aren't confident. It's super annoying to me. But these women are, you know, they are very successful. They are, um, you know, I've got a couple clients now who are female owners of businesses in a, each in two different, but strictly, you know, predominantly male environments, construction, architecture, um, and are just crushing it in their career. Um, but who are, you know, other aspects of their lives are dismantling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I dare say almost every relationship has some form of sexual dysfunction, whatever that looks like. And that's, it's pretty typical of my clients. Yeah. Well, it's easy 
to spend another hour in the office because you can identify the ROI from the extra hour of time in the office. It can bring you tens of thousands, hundreds, even millions of dollars from one extra hour of thinking, creating. Mm -hmm. An extra hour at home with your partner can actually have a net negative effect right. if you're not showing up and being present to your kids. Right. You can wish, wish you hadn't spent that hour there. Right. So that makes sense to me. Um, here's the thing that I'm prepared to bet. Whilst many of your clients are women, to me, that's a demographic. And my experience is that mm -hmm. demographics are less interesting than psychographics. Demographics, yeah. A psychographic describes, for those of you who are listening, it describes the mindsets of your dream clients. Yeah. So I'll do this in a second. I, what I'm hearing about the mindsets of your dream clients, because whilst I've got no doubt many of them are going to be women, because our dream clients are the people who look back at us in the mirror at night. You're your dream client. That's just how it works in this field right. you're in. There'll be some men who you wouldn't turn away because there's something about them who's inspiring to you. And there'll be some women who you wouldn't take them if they had a check in their hand and said, I'll pay you double what you normally charge. That's right. Yeah, that's well said. Okay. Well, All right, I'm going to play with you now. Okay, go ahead. Let's, let's play. Let's see where this lands. Here's, let me pause for a second. Check in. Have I missed anything? No, I think I've got enough to play. Oh, no, there is one thing. Yeah, because this is really interesting to me about you, Kimberly. Because you're not afraid to talk about that phrase that you use, working with, with leaders from the boardroom to the bedroom. Mm -hmm. You're not actually afraid to talk about sex. Right. So tell me, tell me what's there. What else am I missing? Have we not yet talked about? We've, I've got all your business skills on this side. What else is there in the mix that actually makes you unique and unusual in this world? You're not just a business coach, right? All right. Uh -uh. Um, uh, I think because of like my early experiences, childhood experiences, I'm good in the shadows. In fact, that's, you know, there are people who are light workers. I'm a light worker. I'm a shadow walker. That's the, that, that's kind of more my playground. Um, and I'm just, why is that true? I mean, there's probably some stuff in my deep background that we could talk about. So tell me out of the why for a second. Yeah. yeah. Let's leave the why for a second. Don't worry about trying to identify that. Tell me about the shadows. So sex is a shadowy world because we're afraid to talk about it. Uh, you know, in, in the United States where we live, uh, a woman just got, uh, uh, went to court because she was seen topless by her, her stepchildren. We live in a world where we're afraid to talk about the body or about sex. So right. that's a realm that's in the shadows. Yeah. What, what else? What else is in the shadows? Well, I think, <laughs> I actually believe most human conditions are in the shadows. Um, it's this, like for me, your, your creativity, the, the truth of who you really are, your divine existence, we hid that from ourselves in our shadow. And it's this, so what excites me about that is I know, I know, and you cannot talk me out of this, that every human being is really a spirit having a human experience. Mm -hmm. And we all have a divine nature. Mm -hmm. And my work in the world is to help people awaken to who they are as goddesses and gods. And that is lurking in your shadow. Mm -hmm. And it's in your sexuality. It's in the thing that you really most want to create that you don't create. It's whatever you're trying to bring forward into the world. Um, that you're afraid to do because Margaret told you that what you really want to do should be a hobby or Lloyd taught you how to be, a, it's okay to be afraid, but also be very quiet about it. It's the packs that you made with yourself and with your God or about how you would be in the world so you could survive in the world. And all of that energy gets pushed down and repressed. And so when I, when I talk about working with leaders from the boardroom to the bedroom, I believe that 
being a remarkable leader, being a powerful leader is, you know, part of the secret sauce of that is just being in your full expression. And if you're not in your full expression in your intimate relationships, you, you, you just won't reach your highest potential. And so that's why I like to play in that space because I just feel like not a lot of people are talking about it. And when you look at leaders and their suffering, the thing that almost suffers first, always suffers first, are their personal relationships. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I've been, I sacrificed well marriage at the altar of my career. I don't want people to have to live that way. Now that you could argue, maybe that was a marriage that wasn't, wasn't, I didn't want anyway, but how it went down was horrible. And I just, I don't want that for anyone. Great. This is good stuff. Yeah, it's a long, it's a long answer to a short question, but. No, I feel your power. That's why it's great. I feel it. So that's, I'm glad I, I paused. I, I knew there was something else there. Let, let me, let me, you relax, sit back and let this wash over you and see how it lands. Watch what I'm going to do while you talk. Yeah, you drink a glass of wine. That's great. What most people know about Kimberly is that she spent 21 years working in a Fortune 7 firm. She became a senior executive. She built a reputation for running large operational teams across the globe, 12,000 people at its height, and a business portfolio of $14 billion. Her gift is that no matter the size of the team, she knew personal things about people in those teams. She's a storyteller. One of her favorite moments in life and business when her team created a fairy tale about the organization. And it ended up having a bigger return on investment than almost anything else they did that year. Kimberly knows things about people. She sees them and understands deep at the heart of it what's holding them back, what's driving them forward. She knows things about people. There's there's a gift to all of this and there's a dark side to it too. You see, Kimberly's a risk taker. She loves to jump right in. It excites her. And sometimes that can mean that too much risk can be taken. There are times when she is so clear, she will look you in the eyes and say, do this. There's a place where that can cost her if she brings that home in her relationship with her family. But there's a place in the world as a high-level coach and a high-level consultant that when Kimberly says, do this, you need to listen carefully. And 99 times out of 100, you need to do that. For her entire career, Kimberly's been coaching and inspiring people to do things they didn't know they were capable of. It goes back a long way. She's been doing this her entire life. You know, Kimberly was raised by a mum where the only thing she wanted was her mother's approval. And when her mum said, you shouldn't be a writer, that's a hobby, that's not a job. She listened like a great daughter would do. And she went and did what was needed in that moment. Most of Kimberly's clients are living a life that was created with a thought or an action 20 or 30 or 40 years ago because they did something that went against their spirit or went against their heart. And it led to all sorts of success along the journey, but there comes a moment when you're paying a price and you're no longer willing to pay that price. It's the moment most people begin to work with Kimberly. Kimberly's dad taught her it's okay to be afraid 
but you need to be quiet about it. Kimberly almost never screams under pressure. What most people don't know about her is that she can be pretty scared and you wouldn't even be able to tell if you were sitting next to her. There's a place where that's been her gift, but it's also held her back because then people can't really know what's going on for you. Kimberly has had a rebel spirit her entire life. She's a rebel through and through. When people look at her, they often say how much adventure and risk she has. And she hears that and it almost doesn't compute because the constant sense for Kimberly is, I need more adventure and more risk. Most leaders are afraid to look at the shadows. They know how easy it is to spend more and more time in the office because you can make more and more money, have more and more impact, build a bigger and better reputation. And they also know that none of that counts the moment they realize their husband or wife is leaving the kids aren't speaking to them or their team are falling apart because they're focused on the bottom line when the team are focused on their relationships. For Kimberly, there is nothing more important than helping you to awaken to who you really are. She's good in the shadows. She wants to help you be fully expressed, not just making a lot of money, building a reputation, having a big impact but also having a spiritual life and practice, a great sex life, being creative and doing the things that you were meant to do, not just the things that you thought you should do. Can believe clients? Well, if you're highly successful, if you're smart and you're powerful and you're confident, but there are times when you don't even see that for yourself. Kimball is the person you need to spend time with. She will wake you up to yourself. She will help you see the gifts you can't see you have. She'll remind you how confident you are and she'll help you step into the next stage of your life fully expressed and unafraid to do what you desire to do. If that's you, call Kimberly. Yeah, that's beautiful. I think I held my breath for most of that. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. really powerful. I love it. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Oh, gosh. It it feels really good on you. It just it expresses who you are. It will draw out who your dream clients are. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the words that stand out in most of my piece of paper are rebel spirit. <laughs> You've got to draw out these rebels, Kimberly. That's your job. And, and rebels love to be challenged. They will fight back. They'll come out yeah. kicking and screaming. But you can hold them there. Yeah, that's fun for me, <laughs> actually. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Thank you. Thank you for trusting me. Thank you for sharing me some of these parts of your story that I bet you don't share very often, but it's time to share this with the world and it's time to be the do this woman, however you express that, because your people want to hear that. They want to be told what to do. They'll, they'll tell you if it's not right for them, but yeah. they want someone who will look them in the eyes or be unafraid and say, this is what needs to be done because they don't have yeah. many people like that in their life. I do love that. I can't tell you how, much that liberates me. <laughs> I love it. Thanks, Kimberly. Thank you, Rich. For most of human history, it wasn't called coaching, it was called leadership. And it's what I love to do to coach people, to lead people, and to mess with people's thinking. If you'd like more of this, or if you'd like to learn more about our community of extraordinary top performers, Go to richlitvin.com 
forward slash one insight.